If you have an interest in horses and love learning more about horses, the horse industry, teaching, or even managing your own horse business, then you're in the right place. We would love you to join us on our mission, which is to improve the lives of horses around the world through the education of riders, handlers, and trainers. So get comfortable, listen in, and enjoy. This is another of our popular Listener's Choice interviews, which we're playing over the weekend. We've chosen the most popular interviews for you to select the Listener's Choice winner. If you're not sure how the Listener's Choice competition works, have a look at horsechats.com slash choice for the rules and the leaderboard. Today's guest is Johan Schlieter, who we've had on before, who's saddle fitter extraordinaire. But first, before we start, I just want to have a quick chat about vision. And if you've got the same vision as International Horse College, which is to have a world where people safely appreciate, respect and enjoy their horses and the horses appreciate, respect and enjoy their people, then have a look at their website or our website, internationalhorsecollege.com, registered training organisation 31352. Now, Johan, how are you? Very, very good. Oh, Thank you for good. having me back again, Ben. Oh, how are you? It's always valuable to talk to you, Johan. You know, just your your <laughs> knowledge of saddles, you know, it just goes way beyond. You know, I mean, as a coach, of course you've got knowledge. You know, as a competitor, of course you've got knowledge. But I think the depth of knowledge you bring is just extraordinary. So I'm um, happy to have you. Yeah. Now, Johan, in the past, we've talked about saddles and, we, you know, we've chatted a few times. We've talked about things that can go wrong, you know, as far as the saddle goes. Now, today we're going to talk about saddle fitting to actually improve the horse's performance. And I think as a competitor, this is the sort of information I need. You know, you know what's going to go wrong, but if you've got something that we can consider to actually improve, then I think, yep, let's get started. So what we want, of course, is to align the horse and rider spines, both horizontal and vertically, to move as one. Can you talk to us a bit more about that? Yes. Um, When we ride bareback, Mm. we can really feel how the horses move and what's going on underneath us. And we all have felt the different motion in the walk, trot, or canter bareback. Now, when I ride and I have a saddle in between, um, my saddle needs to give me the ability to, to feel that, what I feel when I ride bareback. So when I understand that the back kind of moves up and down in walk and trot mm-hmm. and in canter, it kind of moves like a caterpillar. So it rolls from the haunches or to the lumbar to the back and to the front. And as a rider, trainer, and I remember my ex-coach always says, ride the horse from behind into your hand mm-hmm. and sit down. So when we hear as non-riders the word sit down, we relate that to, well, on the chair. Yeah. Or, or, or yeah, let's, we're sitting on the chair most of the time. Some people sit on the floor, but most people would consider sitting like on the chair. This is absolutely the worst thing you can do on the horse to sit like on the chair. Mm. So if you think about posture for the humans, you know, we have four curves in our spine. Yep. And when we run on walk and we have a bad posture, ligaments and muscles get tight and we kind of deform. But if we are having a good posture, our spine and disc aligns and the energy is much softer in our ankles and, and our knees when we walk or run. So if I visualize these two spines, one what moves up and down in trot and canter on the horse, and like a caterpillar in the canter, and my spine or the rider's spine has four curves, they act like shock absorbers. We don't want to sit on the horse like you sit like on the chair. Yes. Why? Because as soon as you do that, your whole body deforms and your four curves are not smooth. So you sit on the wrong saddle or you have a bad posture on the horse, your weight comes double into the horse's back. So I always like to say when two spines align as one, it's kind of like two musical instruments. When they both have the same tune, oh my God, it sounds so beautiful. But if they are playing a little bit off beat or off tune, Mm -hmm. the two musical instrument sounds horrible. 
And all of us, all from us who have ridden, we know when we feel the movement of the horse's back and my spine is nicely aligned and I'm sitting on the horse, not like on the chair, sort of astride standing, but more standing slash sitting. So old masters in Germany call the seats, the standing seat. So if I have that standing seat in the saddle, then my horse is experiencing much softer impact from the rider's seat. And these two movements can move as one. And that is all of us who have written and experienced that. That's the magic we're trying to create. Okay. Okay. So if we think about the Tai Chi sand, which I'm sure you're going to talk a little bit more about, can we understand then the comparison between the Tai Chi sand and the rider's seat? Yes. So I mentioned just briefly the standing seat. Yes. So if you look at how a Tai Chi stand is, the, the pelvis, the upper body, everything stays the same. You just have your legs a little bit apart, like let's say 24 inches, and you bend slightly in your knees, but your pelvis doesn't pivot back or forth. You just have your legs 24 inches apart on the feet, and then you bend your knees gentle. So you don't lean forward and don't lean back. And when you put your hands in front of you with your fingertips up, that's what they call the Tai Chi stand. And the Tai Chi stand is taught in martial arts as a very balanced and very secure stand. So if somebody pushes me from the back or the front, I have a very solid stand. And if I want to spin very fast around one leg, I'm very balanced. Mm -hmm. Now, the difference between a Tai Chi stand and a rider's standing seat, there's only two differences. The weight is not on the feet. It's now on the seat bones on the rider. And instead of your fingers up, hold your hands normal with a slight relaxed fist and hold the reins. So you are having a very aligned spine. You're very much balanced. So if the horse spooks, or runs away, you are totally solid, and you can pivot with your pelvis and sit soft with the horse's back. Did that make sense, Candice? Yes, yes, I'm actually doing it right now, <laughs> just to get the feeling. Yep, yep. I was wondering where all the wind was. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, I think you you can explain things very well. I, I want to go back to the previous point was, you know, just the caterpillar, and I, I've never heard it explained, but... As you talk about the caterpillar, I just visualize mm. that and go, oh, yeah, yeah, it does, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Sort of a rolling motion, yes, right? Yes, yes, no, that makes sense. Now, what should we do then if we're thinking about aligning the horse, the riders and the horse's balance, you know, their points, the center of gravity, mm -hmm. how do they align? So if you ride bareback and mm. nobody tells you how to ride, you just have to get there somehow on the sure. back. Yep. You fall three or four times down, and then nobody told you, but your instinct will put you in a spot where you say, oh, this is the spot where the least amount of bouncing occurs. Mm -hmm. I'm going to sit here. Yep. The most bouncing where the back goes up and down is right in the middle of the horse's back. Mm -hmm. The least amount of bouncing is way on top of the croup. And I just come back from the horse museum in Kentucky, USA. Mm -hmm. where they're shown how the ancestors, when the horses were very small, they were sitting on top of the croup. So when you see the old, old ancient pictures, how people used to sit on the horse, they were sitting first on the top of the croup. Then they kind of moved in the middle. But then when Xenophon and other militarists says, okay, where can we sit the most balanced and the most less amount of bouncing? is where the rodeo rider sits today. If you watch a rodeo rider, they scoop right to the withers. Yep. They tie their hands to the little rope. Yep. Okay, open the gate, let the horse go. So right at the base of the withers is where the least amount of bouncing is on the horse. So if you pretend you're Superman and you can lift the horse with one arm up, if you place your hand on the horse's sternum, the end of the horse's sternum, and you're super strong, you can lift the horses up and the pivoting point, the balance point, is pretty much right there. Okay. So if you go straight up from that end of the sternum, you will see most horses where the base of the withers is. Mm -hmm. So you want to sit the front part of your pelvis, or better, your center balance. In other words, you sit flat, you lay flat on the, on the floor 
and there's Superman again who lifts you up. So he puts your hand on the sternum of your body and you are stiff as a board and you, he lifts you up, you will see that's your balance point. So you will actually align your sternum over the horse's sternum and guess what? The horse can spin, he can buck. And like if you look at the jockeys, when he has his butt way back and his knee really far forward, the sternum always aligns over the sternum of the horse. Mm -hmm. Look at the trick riders, the jumpers, the dressage rider, the endurance riders, the pleasure rider. If you align the sternum of the rider and the sternum of the horse, you align the center gravity of horse and rider and both can move in harmony. And the least amount of bouncing and impact will occur. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah, it does. Yeah, yeah. All right. Now, what about the reflex points that cause negative reactions from the horse? You know, how many are there? And tell us a bit more about them. Yes. Yeah, so um, today we have all kinds of tools. We have power up the cameras. We got computerized saddle uh, uh, saddle pad that measures pressure. We got uh, ultrasound. We got all these amazing tools. What really help us to um, find and detect the areas yep. to make it very very easy without running out on and get all these fancy tools. A very easy way to see is you got to ask yourself why does the stallion bite the mare around the withers. Around the wither cup, in front and in the back around the withers, approximately three inches down, is where the teeth will hit. Mm -hmm. And over the 34, 5 million years, that's where the stallions, when they fight, bite each other, or yep. when they mate, they bite the mare. So the saddle can have the same effect and bite in that area. So the wither cup is one of the areas you do not want to pinch. Along the spine, there are six. So if you pinch the spine, it's just like on humans, between each vertebrae, there's nerves come out. And you can run your fingertip gentle along. You can see how the back muscle spasms. You don't have to press a lot. Same like when you take the people on the bottom of the feet. You don't have to scratch them hard. You just barely touch the bottom of the feet and they're ticklish. Mm. See, okay. tickling is nerve touching nerve endings. And then we have on the lumbar area, right behind the last rib, the uh, 18th rib, that's an area when you push on it, they're buck. They cause the bucking reflex points. Then along the sides, there are four of them. When the girth is not the right length, you hit the edge of the latissimus or pectoralis. Which person likes to be tickled underneath the armpit or right on the edge of the, your chest muscle? That's the same thing. Your girth, well, most of the time, is a very good girth, but it is the wrong size in terms of length. And you know what? If the length is not right, the buckle sit right on top. So the other two is the area on the shoulder. Very, very vulnerable. Now in New Zealand, a vet goes all around the world and shows that publish how, when they dissect the horse, how they can see how the tree damaged the cartilage of the horse. So you definitely don't want to do that. And last but not least, if you visualize pressure if you squish a grape where people make wine of you don't need a lot of pressure of that to squish a grape mm -hmm. now that type of pressure on top of the shoulder blade four inch down from the wither cup yep. from the from the top of the withers that's why it's called the mp13 the bladder meridian point 13 that's a lung reflex point so if your saddle slides forward or push too much the horse's heartbeat will go up and we can measure that with heart monitors. And we know from the human medicine, there is uh, in an excessive level of cortisol, and that is how we measure stress. So if you stay away from each of the sides, it's a total in of the horse of 26 uh, reflex points. Wow, wow. Yeah. Then the horse enhances their performance because mm -hmm. you have to ride 20 minutes before these nerves are numb. And I don't know you, but back then when I trained eight to ten horses, I don't have time <laughs> to waste 200 minutes yes. until my horse is numb. Yes, yes. So that's a, a waste of time and never mind what the horse's pain goes through. Now, to do with the girth, mm -hmm. the proper girth length and shape. You know, you mm -hmm. said about it being the, if it's the wrong size, wrong shape, it's going to upset. But what's, what is the best shape of a girth and how do we choose the girth yeah. length? 
Yes, um, the girth length is, um, let me answer this a little bit different first with okay. fitting a saddle. Yep. If the saddle is fitted like a riding helmet, this chin strap of the helmet doesn't need to be tight. As a matter of fact, if you make that strap super, super tight on the chin strap, you can't chew, you can't lick, you're super tight, and you're out of balance. Mm -hmm. So your strap of your helmet most of the time is touching your chin, but it's not digging into your tissue. Yep. Yep. And that is how a girth has to be. So most of the time, um, if a helmet of a person fits at the length, in the width, and in the side, the helmet stays pretty good on. And the mm -hmm. strap is just there in case there's a sudden movement that the helmet doesn't fly. So with uh, choosing the right girth, it needs to be away from those reflex points on the pectoralis. That's approximately four inches above the elbow, diagonal back to the middle of the stomach. You want to stay away from that diagonal line. And the latissimus. The latissimus line is from the 18th rib to the middle of the horse's trunk in the front. So there is a good space of 15 inches where you have areas where you can put your short girth. And above that, there's another good area of a 10-inch circle where you can put your long girth or your jumpers. Mm -hmm. right? So okay, yep. what I always, always surprises me, most of the Western riders have a 14 and a half or 14 hand or 14.3 hand girth. And um, they have a 30-inch girth. And then dressage <laughs> riders sometimes have a girth what is, sorry, a horse 17.3, but the girth is 24. Most, most Western riders have the right girth size. Why? Because if the girth is away from these edges and comes nice and high, just below the widest point of the horse's trunk, the saddle stays steady. Okay. The girth will keep the saddle quiet and will help it if you get the wrong, right, sorry, if you get the right shape. Mm -hmm. Now, for me, there is so much hype about this girth and that girth. Sometimes the simplest girth out in the market is the best. Pick the right length and you don't have to spend an arm and a leg for a good girth. Okay, okay. Stop. I need to interrupt this chat for a hot off the press notification. That is that the latest version of the book, 101 Careers in the Horse Industry, is now available and the best news is that it's a free download. So if you work in the horse industry, if you have a plan to work in the horse industry and have a career in the horse industry, or if you know someone who plans to have a career in this fabulous industry, then this is an essential book for you to read now and then keep as a reference as you progress through your career. With over 100 jobs to choose from, you'll probably find at least one that you'd happily do without being paid. So simply go to internationalhorsecollege.com scroll down to the bottom of the page and click on the 101 careers in the horse industry button to receive your free career book. Imagine, maybe one day you could be a guest on Horse Chats. Now, you talked about the, the helmet, and I know that, you know, fitting the helmet, we do it every mm -hmm. time. You know, every time you're about to give a lesson, the gear check, part of the gear check is to check that the helmet's fitting correctly. But how often, I mean, do we fit the saddle? What else do we need to know about fitting the saddle? So I'm going to start first with the helmet again. Yeah. Most of the time, unless the child grows a lot and the head gets bigger, you need a new helmet. But most of the time, as an adult, if your head fully grows out, you don't need another size helmet. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Depends if it's, of course, broken or whatever. Sure. But in the helmet fitting, the length is very important and the width yes. and the way the helmet comes down on the side. My son-in-law has a much shorter head but much wider head. Mm -hmm. And his sides are much wider. My head is longer and narrow. So we need to have on the saddle fitting the length. It cannot sit in the lumbar area or, as I just mentioned, on the cartilage or on the lung meridian point. So the length is number one. So while the horse grows and gets older, his scapula or her scapula will come back. And that might be a problem that all of a sudden your saddle is too long for the horse. So the bottom of the saddle is always, always for the length of the horse's ribcage, and the top of the saddle is always for the rider's seat. Very often people say, but I need a big saddle, and 
how can I fit this horse that doesn't have a top long rib cage? Well, in 1978, there was an Olympian by the name of Christine Stückelberger. She rode a horse, his name was Granat. Granat was 18 one huge horse. She was winning left, right, center in Olympic level dressage, but she was only four foot eleven, mm. soaking wet, maybe ninety five pounds. <laughs> so the bottom of the saddle was like an eighteen and a half seat, but the top was the fifteen. And today we can have a saddle English sizes. Today we can have a saddle English size seventeen and a half, eighteen. On the bottom is sixteen. So. The bottom is for the horse, the top seat for the rider, and then the width. While the horse gets older or stronger, his shoulders get wider. Horse don't have collarbone. So the tree width needs to be checked. So the latest research that's published from the Saddle Research Trust in England has said a saddle needs to be checked every 12 to 14 weeks. Mm. This is, of course, uh, really difficult for manufacturers, for riders, for trainers, because A, where do you get the fitters and so on and so forth. But um, in general, I always like to say if a horse is under five years old, you have a twice check in the year. Yep. And if he's, if he's until he's eight, uh, you check it maybe once a year. And then when he's eight to 15, once every two years and after 15, they age very fast, you go back to twice a year. But with all these findings, Glennis, what we have now these days, they really recommend to have the saddles now checked every three to four months. Okay, okay, yep, yep. And I do get you, you know, you're going to get a new helmet and you've got to get the right brand because some brands are a bit longer and shorter and some fit to make the right helmet, yeah. Exactly. Yeah, but going back to the saddle, you've talked about avoiding the reflex points that are going to cause negative reactions from the horse. How can we avoid this whole, you know, think about, I just want to know a bit more about high pressure mm -hmm. and proper nutrition and oxygen to the muscle. Talk a little bit about that. Yes. So um, pressure gets measured in all different kind of ways, depends on what country you are. Yep. But we know out of the medical field, if you have more than 4.67 kPa, that's kilopascal, the muscle doesn't get the nutrition or the oxygen, what it needs. And if that's happening, then the muscle will atrophy. It literally dies. So uh, in North America, people call pressure pounds per square inch, PSI. KPA is just a different way of naming a unit. So kind of like centimeters and inches. So if we have today all this equipment where we can say, uh oh, look at the saddle. The saddle is badly fitted or doesn't fit the horse properly or it's been restuffed very bad. You're creating pressure points and sometimes the panels are not wide enough to distribute the rider's weight. So with the testing, we can see that some saddles are in the 17 to 18 kPa Mm -hmm. And if you have two soft trees, there's a lot of flex trees or treeless saddles, then you're over 28 kPa. So needless to say, that is way, way above what the tissue can handle. And that is what more and more people, I mean, um, the beautiful work you do with horse shads and, and magazines, what's out there and trade shows, People really educate themselves, but at any given time, at today's world of internet, people can just easy, oh, what did I hear? I'm going to mm -hmm. ask Google yes. or any yes. kind of information, mm -hmm. and I can do the research in a matter of seconds. So if we know this, we as a manufacturer, all saddle manufacturer, it is our job, our duty to create and build saddles so we are way below that 4.67. And that is what I am so proud to say. We have proven this in the Western world, in the racing saddles, in the jumper dressage pleasure endurance saddles, and no horse or rider should ever unintentionally hurt their horses just because some manufacturers don't care about it. It's out there, you know, so it's so important to know that you don't put excess pressure on the horse. Okay, okay. Now, I know we've talked before about the letter F, fit for function. 
you know, and avoiding the mm-hmm. fashion, if fit for fashion, fit for fad. So can we just go over how important that is about about getting the function right? Yes. So the industry level, yes, they accept up to 11 kPa, which is more than twice what the tissue can handle. Oh, okay. And I don't understand why they do it. Mm. Maybe they do it because they want to fit for fashion. And I remember when I made my first bridles in 1978, and somebody said, oh, why don't we put nice, white, shiny patent leather behind the bra bench so it's really nice on the horse's head, and it looked beautiful. Mm. And then um, my coach says, you would never want to have something like that because you, it's called a horse show, not a tag show or people show. And you want to keep the horses in its beauty as much as you can. So it was really not well thought of to bling up your saddle. Mm-hmm. Today you have bling and shiny stuff and all this and that. Times change and we can have a lot of fashion saddles so long we don't make the horse suffer. And today we have this saddle is promoted by so-and-so. They get anywhere from 200 to 500,000 euros over a big contract. And people say, oh, I want that saddle, but so-and-so rides. And it has nice bling and blong, and that saddle gets fit for fashion because so and so rides. And it makes me really mad that people forget, you know, just because some professional golf player who plays golf has a certain shoe style in a certain club, that might work for him, but not for us. Mm. So I will very quickly know. Oh, yeah, that's the wrong equipment. But if there's a horse in between and the horse has to suffer, yes, then I think the fit for fashion should be really be ignored. And back to the old way, when it was fit for function, we should look for it. Do you think it's just lack of education that people, you know, they've got to hire the industry in accepted values of the 11 KPAs and the fitting the horse with stuff that's going to make the horse uncomfortable? Is that just about education? Is that, you know, I mean, what we're doing here, sure, it's educating people. Is that the main reason, do you think? Glennis, I could not believe when I read that that research was done in 2014, that's six years ago, Yep. that the high pressure. And only two years ago, when the Saddle Research Trust, it's a non-profit organization out of England, you have to be a doctor or a medical doctor, or some kind of uh, veterinarian to be part of uh, that board. Yep. You could be a member, but the people who really do the research, they publish this. And the industry tried to hide this for a long, long time because mm-hmm. they want to sell saddles. Sure. I want yep. to sell saddles too, but not mm. for, the, for, for the harming of the horse. Yes. Right? Yep. So... If you want to catalog sale, if you want to sell saddle on the internet, that doesn't work. You know, mm. you cannot, you got to have the saddle fitted to the horse because it's so finicky. Yeah. But uh, again, this is kind of, back to your question, hidden a little bit. And now, because of um, individual groups, they're going to bring this out now. And you said if it's a lack of education, I think... Uh, it's of manipulation. You know, people are so geared by marketing and, and social media and vets and other people uh, who really stand up for the horses don't have it anymore. They, they just t- say it the way it is. And yeah, I love it. yeah. Okay, well, you know, hopefully with, with you coming on Horse Chats, we've educated a few more people about it. <laughs> but also, too, you've got Saddle Fit for Life. So, I mean, we do general education, right? So we do mm-hmm. education and try and bring in everyone within the horse industry. But you really specialise in Saddle Fit. So just, you know, the, I think the time's right now to just tell us a bit about Saddle Fit for Life. Saddle Fit for Life um, is on five continents. And I'm so pleased to tell you that since we talked uh, last, we are now live on Perfect. online academy. So that yep. means people from all over the world can take the saddle fitting course. And um, the beautiful part about that is that we can train trainers to do the practical part. It's very straightforward. But the actually 
asking the question. And just like you said, yeah, I kind of know it, but I never saw it from this side. Mm. It's not rocket science, but if you explain the why, if you explain the why, then the people understand. And you heard me saying this a lot. People who know the how will always follow the people who know the why. Yep, yep, yep. All right. I think we've got to talk a little bit more because we had talked about doing something as well with International Horse College and Saddle Fit for Life. So nothing nothing confirmed, but we do need to talk a little bit more about that, I think. But, um, mm-hmm. yeah. Meanwhile, let's go on to saddle pad shapes and materials. Yes. Well, I don't know how to say it without sounding too rude, but I'm going to just try it. <laughs> go on. The uh, – the, um, Underwear is, or, or the socks is the easiest way for people to understand. Yep. If the shape of the underwear doesn't fit right, people are uncomfortable. It doesn't matter how good the pants or the dress feels. Mm-hmm. And it is there just for one reason, to eliminate the shaping. And underwears are so much easier to wash than the whole dress all the time or the suit. Socks the same way. You know, so if the sock is the wrong shape and that little seam does not sit properly underneath your heel or toe, yep. you go all crazy. And that's the way it's shaped. With saddle pad, what is directly on the horse's largest organ, the skin, yep. that if it doesn't follow the top contour of the horse's top line, is probably the first 80% of the problem in saddle fitting. Mm-hmm. It's caused by the seam what doesn't sit right. So once you have the seam right and fits the top line, the saddle pad doesn't move. Then comes the materials. The material, thinner is better. More natural is better. University in Vienna done a test, and they find out that deer hair, saddle pads made out of deer hair, is by far the best saddle pads. It's just unreasonable expensive. So the second best they find is sheepskin pad. So the sheepskin, the true sheepskin, what um, Western saddles have on the bottom, not the fake, the real, is there to cool. Some saddles, uh, some companies have these half pads made out of sheepskin. And if the company makes a saddle pad with sheepskin, they always put it towards the horse because that cools the horse's back. Yep. If you see people have these half pads with sheepskin. They always put it between the saddle and the saddle pad. Yeah. Yes, yes. And the, argu- and the argument is says, hey, you know what? It's perfect. It's, it keeps it clean. Mm. It's kind of like you put your socks over your shoes. <laughs> so the socks are <laughs> so you know, the walking clean. on the ground. Yep. <laughs> yeah, I know. This. So the saddle pad that actually creates the opposite and it creates heat. And you, as an endurance rider, would be pulled after the first 20 20- miles mm-hmm. because you now see that the vet says oh my god the horse's back is overheat mm. so the shape is super important number two keep the product natural keep it to something what can be easily washed wool felt wonderful product or just cotton pads anything else is a pure marketing and it creates more problems than you really want to yeah. And I've seen that, unfortunately, too often. The saddle and the girth is perfect, but they got these expensive pads, and they says, oh, I need my saddle refitted because my horse's back is sore. Mm-hmm. Like, do you would like to take an, a um, balloon, what you have at parties, and rub it back and forth over your hair? You would have electricity in your hair. Yeah. And that's exactly many, many products made out of it with a cool marketing idea what warms up the back. Mm. Maybe warms it up a little bit too much. Mm. Mm. So that's kind of the downside on, on yes, on that. Yep. All right. Well, good to know anyway. I, I don't know if we've got any deer hair, but sheepskin certainly. A, a good oh choice. yeah. 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 <laughs> now the whole, you know, we talked a lot, and I know that you do saddles for everything. You know, you've talked about English and Western, but you've also talked about racing and endurance, and and I'm sure that every sort of saddle that's required. But generally, you know, English and Western are probably the most popular and Western's got a lot going for it. Tell us about how to combine that Western function with the English fit, what we should do. So I'm making saddles since 1978. That's over 42 years now. Yep. And uh, 
in the last seven years, we made a lot of, we started to make a lot of Western saddles. And I always wondered, how is that possible that the heavier person with smaller horses and heavier saddles have way less back damage on the horse than the bigger horse, the smaller rider with an English saddle? Mm. And then people will say, well, the Western riders don't ride competitive. Well, hello, they do barrel racing, they do competitive, and there's even an Olympic level now. Of course they do competitive, and they are riding just as long when they go for pleasure as an English rider would. So the answer is very simple. It's pounds per square inch. If you look at the frame of an English tree and you look at the frame of a Western tree, you're like, by far, by far, uh, having less pounds per square inch with the Western saddle. Yep. So we just come back in November from New Zealand, Equitana, where we won the Product Innovation Award. Why? Because we are now install or and with materials which are as thin as a credit card we have in each saddles two trees we have for the horse a western base and we have on the top the english base for the english saddle and for the western rider we have now it looks like a western saddle just like the english saddle looks like an english saddle but for the Western saddle, we have for the first time where you can adjust the bars seven different ways. In the past, you couldn't do that. Mm -hmm. Now, why is that now necessary? Because in the past, we only had the quarter horses or the selected army horses. Today, we put Western saddles on Frisians. So with this new design, we call it binate. If you Google binate, it stands for born or made out of two equal parts. We created now a saddle that is under 3.9 kPa, and that's why we won Product of the Year award. Wow, wow, that's really good. You know, I'm just looking at the industry standard of the 11 kPa's, which you said was over twice. So what did you say? It was 3.3. 3.9. Wow, wow. Yes, so okay. it's, uh, it's super exciting for us, mm, mm, mm. of course. And um, all yeah. right. Perfect. Now, if someone's going to do, you know, I'm just thinking about one thing. I'm thinking one thing that, you know, that I'm going to look at for sure is to look at, um, you know, more sheepskin saddlecloths. Mm -hmm. But if, if someone's going to do one thing to go away and consider, you know, we're talking about consideration to improve the horse's performance, what's one thing they could do? Okay. So the number one thing I always say, does the saddle allow me to sit comfortable yep. behind the end of the withers. So yes. I sit where it's the least amount of bounds. Yep. Perfect. And does it end in front of the lumbar area and doesn't go on the shoulder. So if you get the right length and the right balance, then that's your starting point. Okay, good. If you have a saddle what puts it's too long or places you in the wrong spot, you're fighting no matter what you do. Because the length the length and that sweet spot where the saddle puts you, you cannot change. Yep. If you got that right, the rest of the saddle fitters can help you. Good. Now, Good. Dennis, can I give you the uh, the new um, Academy website? Look, perfect. I just need somewhere, and, and I would like to refer people to that Academy, but also to, you know, just to contact you. I'm sure the, the details should be on that website anyway, shouldn't it? What is the new website, Johan? It's Saddle Fit. And then the number four, and then live, L-I-F-E, academy.com. So it's S-A-D-D-L-E-F-I-T, then the let, then the number four, yep. L-I-F-E-A-C-A-D-E-M-Y.com. We have free courses. We have lots of videos there. And if you want to make this your profession, you want to help your own horse or your friends, we have so many different courses there. And also, last week, it's just been uh, finalized now. We are now have used those courses to go in universities where their students get a full credit at the university course to become a veterinarian. So this okay. is uh, exciting times. People are really seeing it, how serious it is. Mm. 
mm-hmm. and how much they can do to help the horse and themselves. Yes, yes, for sure. I'm just having a look here and the contact details are there as well. So that's probably the best place for people to contact you now. Absolutely. Because it's, I'm sure that if people have got questions, if they want to know when you're around, where to contact you, when they can actually see you, that would be really good. Yes. All right, Johan, perfect. Looking forward to catching up with you again. But every time you come on, you know, you sort of think you've got enough knowledge about saddles, but every time you come mm-hmm. on, you, you have specialist areas and you can keep telling us more. So looking forward to it. All right. So if anyone would like to learn more about saddlery, thinking about taking this as a career, then certainly contact Johan at saddlefitforlifeacademy.com. And those details will be on horsechats.com slash, well, I don't know how many it'll be now, but just search for (laughs) Johan or search for Sleaze. And I think if you just search for saddle fit, you'd find it anyway. Search for saddlery, saddle fitting. Um, all of those things will come up in the search for Johan. So looking forward to chatting with you again, Johan, and um, yep, we'll catch up with you soon. Thank you. Thank you, Candice. Bye. Bye-bye. If you've enjoyed this chat, then please comment, rate, and subscribe. If you'd like any changes or recommendations for guests, then please contact us through horsechats.com. And while you're online, have a look at the government accredited courses at internationalhorsecollege.com. Registered Training Organisation 31352. Remember that our comments and instructions are general in nature and do not take into consideration your individual horses or your individual ability and circumstances. If you enjoyed this podcast, then please leave your comment below 